Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Rouge Rugby Podcast. My name is Dan Murphy, and with me always is the fantastic Derek Brissett and the amazing Stu Hardy. Gentlemen, I hope things are going well, uh, but we have another guest on the show, uh, the fantastic Lucas Romball from uh, the Toronto Arrows and from Rugby Canada. Lucas, you mentioned to us before that this is, we're, we're taking your, your podcast V-card, so we are extremely honoured to be able to take that away from you, and uh, thank you for joining the show. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm glad it was a Canadian podcast that uh, was able to do it. So we're going to get, we're going to get right into it. And uh, how has training camp gone so far? Uh, this will be, you know, your third po- uh, third uh, training camp with the arrows. And uh, this one's definitely got to be a weird one for you. Yeah, it's uh, so far it's been great. You know, it's been great to kind of get back with the boys. I got a little bit of a taste of it in November with the Canada camp, but uh, it's good to get back with the Toronto team and the guys coming in a little different since everyone's kind of staggering and at different times we have guys coming from, you know, Uruguay and out West and they have to uh, quarantine and, you know, we got to follow the rules. So there's no breaking that we're getting no exemptions. So they kind of sprinkle in. Well, we added uh, a few of the Uruguayans on Monday this week and we'll get a few more next week. So it's, it's nice, but, but completely different than years past. Sort of speaking of years past, the way we kind of generally start all of these interviews that we have been doing um, just because it is kind of interesting with uh, how people kind of just got into rugby within this country. Um, so first question or first, like real, I guess, in-depth question here. Um, we just kind of want to know, like, what got you started into rugby? Uh, obviously, you know, you played all the, you know, Balmy Beach, played for Queens, um, Arrows, uh, Canada National Team. Just how, just walk us through uh, the Lucas Rumball rugby journey. It's pretty simple, really. It was uh, my brothers, you know, we're in high school at, at Senator O'Connor here in uh, Scarborough, and they had a teacher there who, who taught rugby and basically got them out when they were there. And I was in the summer of grade uh, eight at the time, it would have been. So I was around uh, 12, I think. And uh, I had nothing to do in the summer. I'd stopped playing soccer. I was playing box across for a bit and kind of didn't want to keep doing that. And they were like, well, why don't you try, you know, rugby? And uh, Paul Duris was the, the teacher um, at the time, and he was also coaching the, the U14 team at the time. And they basically were like, go out, talk to him. He's a great guy. You know, you'll make friends right away. And sure enough, first practice, I made uh, two of my you know best friends that I, that I have now. And I still talk to them these days, still hang out. And so it was kind of just a family thing, a grassroots thing that really got me into it. And another question that we ask all our guests when they come on the podcast is, um, who are the players that you are always keen to watch whenever they're playing? And who do you like cheering on? Uh, Right now, you know, I'd probably be uh, Michael Hooper is a big guy. I like watching when he's on the field. You know, he's an older guy in the game now, I guess you'd say. A lot of test caps, really experienced, the leader. So he's a good guy to kind of watch how he plays and pick up on little things he does and adjust your own game to it. Um, and then I always like watching Faf de Klerk because you never know what that guy's going to do. You never know where the ball is going. It's it's crazy sometimes what that guy does. Some of the best hair in the, in the game too. You know, um, definitely, definitely does. So we've got we've got an Irish fan and myself. We've got Stu who's maybe on cloud nine about Wales. He definitely has mixed emotions about it, but what have you thought about the six nations so far? And, and in the end, who do you really think is going to be lifting that trophy? Is it going to be the French or can someone uh, sneak from behind and, and take it from them? Uh, it's been exciting so far. You know, it's, it's been nice to get that kind of weekly game back in with the six nations, you know, that layer of normalcy that I think we've been missing in the past year and a bit. So that's, that's always a plus. And the rugby's been entertaining, really close matches, you know, down to the wire, some games, individual mistakes really costing some teams. I'm going to have to, you know, stick with France. I think they've been playing quite well. And it's a t- it's going to be tough to knock them off, especially, you know, if they keep building momentum like this and keep winning games, they're, they're going to be a tough team to take out. That breaks my heart, especially since of the, the, this, this game on Sunday. That was a, that was a heartbreaker. 
Um, well, we're not going to talk about Ireland's first game. That was even more of a heartbreaker. Holy moly! You're you're the one that brought this up, Dan. I don't know why you. you... Uh, I didn't. I didn't think that he would go with the French. I thought he would go with a little bit more of like a maybe maybe Scotland can pull it from behind kind of thing or something. I don't know. I don't know what I, was I do thinking. like an underdog, but you got you got to go with the hot hand sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um. Lucas, you were part of kind of the leadership team for the Arrows for the past couple of seasons. Um, we're kind of just going to start now with with what we expect from 2021 going in with the Arrows. Have you and the management team begun to sort out what the leadership team for this upcoming season is going to look like? Or is that going to be something that's going to develop over the training camp time and leading into the start of the season? I mean, you lost uh, your, you know, your, ca- your captain from last year, Dan Moore, to retirement. So kind of go through with us what – the processes to developing the 2021 leadership team? Yeah, I, I think it's it's always a developing situation when it comes to the leadership side of things. Um, you know, guys bring something different in either the way they play, the way they speak, you know, the way they can rally guys to do something. So I think it's an always ever-changing uh, group. Uh, we've definitely settled already the management on a, on a core group of guys. They want to roll over kind of from last year and introduce some new guys into it to try and make things run smoothly. Um, Losing Dan was, was, you know, it's big. Uh, He was obviously a a key part of the team and a key voice in the team, but I think, you know, he created a strong group of guys as well. And you're really only as strong as your group. It's, it's not always down to one guy. And I think the guys are more than capable of picking up the slack there. Yeah, and obviously, you know, with with some guys departing like Dan Moore and Sam Malcolm, there's obviously a lot of incoming players too, right? And I mean, I know you kind of mentioned that, you know, some of the Uruguayans or Argentinian guys have to, you know, they're in the process of doing some quarantine stuff. Um, But what has, I guess, been sort of your first impressions of a handful of like the new players that are joining the team throughout the first like week of camp and even maybe some guys that you got to see for the first time or so on the pitch uh, back at the high performance camp in um, in November? And is, is there anybody that's been uh, kind of standing out to you as far as some of the new recruits on the team this year? We don't really have all of our guys in the new guys, especially just with the way that Fair it's enough. been working. So unfortunately I can't kind of comment on the, the performance side of things, but on how they'll fit into the team. I know Mark and like the management do a great job of uh, selecting people as well. So they want guys who are going to uh, fit in really well and kind of who aren't going to be above the team, you know, cause that's a big core concept of the arrows is that, we're for each other and we'll, we'll work together as a team to accomplish a goal. There's basically no one above the rest of each other. So um, to the character, all the guys I've met so far and over zoom and over calls have been fantastic. And I'm kind of eager to meet them in person and kind of see what they can really do out in the, there on the field. What, what kind of like thing, like, I guess with training camp, like how much of it is just like, instead of like watching like film as like a group in a room together, like how much has to actually like be like virtual and stuff. And is like, how strange of a transition has that been? Like, I guess over the course of all of 2020 pretty much and leading up into training camp and I guess through the first week now. It's, it's a logistical light, uh, nightmare really. Um, you know, you got to kind of like, if a guy misses a flight on one day, he has to get on the next Height and the way things are working in the world right now, that might not be for another four. So you expect him to be in one week, he might be in the next. Um, and then that throws your whole training thing, like your numbers are all messed up. So what do you shift here? What do you shift there? With regards to like the meetings and, and the online stuff, um, you know, we they limit guys. We're trying to separate our meeting rooms so that, you know, the backs will be at one time, the forwards will be at other. It'll be the same meeting, but just done twice. Try and limit the amount of time guys are kind of in really close contact with each other. So that aspect of things are different and guys are spaced out. Like I've never sat so far <laughs> in a meeting. It's kind of odd and everyone's got their mask on, right? So it's kind of something we're getting used to and uh, hopefully we won't have to do it forever, but the boys are the boys are adhering really well and, and getting on with that change. Um, yeah. Listen, I, I work in a grade two, three classroom. So I know all about the logistics of keeping people apart and and trying to to run uh, lessons when we're uh, during the COVID time. So I completely understand what you're saying. 
yeah, it's uh, hopefully we get back to the normal soon, but uh, it'll be good. Uh, and this, the sessions are running great. Like the coaches are doing a fantastic job, you know, implementing with all these changes and, you know, on the fly, this guy's not here. Okay. We'll, we'll shift to this or we'll work on this and you can always improve on something. So there won't ever be kind of a, a time or a meeting loss. And on the subject of logistical nightmares, mm. it was announced that Toronto will be starting the season, not in the great white North, but in Atlanta. And so how are you guys feeling about the move? And is there any, has there been any discussion on what the setup will look like for you guys? Uh, there's been some some small discussions on what the setup will be looking like. We'll be using a lot of uh, Atlanta's facilities that they have already, their gyms, their fields, and you know, there's just a few Canadians on the team, the Matt Eaton and uh, Connor Keys, and you know, we've reached out to them, like myself, on a personal level, and the, and the leadership group as well, just to have a chat and see what's going on. And on the management side. The Atlanta management has been fantastic with answering questions and, you know, sorting all that stuff out. So I, I don't think there's a worry when it comes to the facilities. We were down there for, I think it was four days last year and, and it worked really well. So it'll just be kind of an extended stay. Uh, how the boys are feeling, I think it varies from guy to guy. Some some guys will be loving it, you know, something different. But guys with families or guys, you know, who have more things going on in Toronto or wherever they're based out of are going to probably be struggling a little bit because, Right now, it's uh, we're hoping to get back, you know, for that May June, but it's all dependent, and you got to roll with the punches. I think that's one of the big themes this year is kind of stuff's always going to change, so there's no sense in fighting it, complaining about it. Get on with it, pull together as a team, you know, regroup and, and go into it heads on with a with a positive mindset. So, just kind of, I guess, building off of that, I know, like in 2019 season, you get the arrows. Obviously, had that eight, like that bizarre schedule of eight road games and then all eight home games. Um, and I know there was a lot of kind of players moving in and out because of the ARC mm -hmm. uh, happening at the same time as that eight game road trip. But I also have heard like a handful of guys that were on the team during that year say like how much that road trip helped with like team bonding and like building like the team chemistry and things like that and as i know like the situation probably isn't very comparable and stuff but like do you feel like there's anything that you guys can kind of like draw on from that experience of being on like kind of on the road i know you got to come back to toronto like between those games but mm -hmm. having that massive road trip where you guys can do all that team bonding and things is there anything that you can kind of draw from that experience that you think maybe could help you if you have to have an extended stay in Atlanta? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it was a good learning experience for a ton of the guys who were involved in a lot of that. I was one of the guys who was bounced away to the ARC and back. Um, so I didn't have that full experience, but having been traveling during that ARC and been on long tours before, you kind of, you know, you, you look forward to the coming home or the playing of the home games. And I think that's a big thing we can use this year is we are going to be returning at some point. We don't know when, but it will be happening, you know, and let's put ourselves in the best position. So when we do come back to that first home game, we're, we're maybe in the playoffs, maybe we're, you know, finishing the season on a really high note here, what, whatever it is, we're coming back to something positive and something we can continue to build off instead of, you know, just complaining that we've been on the road and that things aren't going our way because that's not going to get us anywhere. And this is kind of going to go on off of, uh, off of that. Yeah. As a team, how are you guys feeling about the upcoming season, especially how things are kind of ended in 2020? You know, you guys were, were top of the table in the Eastern Conference before the shutdown. Do you guys have expectations other than winning the MLR Shield? I, I think we want to, you know, pick up where we left off. Uh, myself, I was a little disappointed in, our, in that last game. I think we kind of took the, the foot off the pedal there and it kind of gets lost with, how everything, you know, it was COVID after that season shut down, but, but that game definitely wasn't our best against Colorado there. So it's a little bit of a disappointing, you know, way to finish that season. So it, it'd be one I would like to have back and we can write that, you know, with the first game of the season this year, and then we can keep building on that. Um, you know, we, we never want to get worse as individuals or as players. We always want to keep pushing that bar higher and higher. And I think we can keep doing that this year, you know, take each week at a time and just get better. So that by the end of the year, we are the best team we possibly could be. And uh, like, what do you think is 
going to be like some of the keys to making the arrows the best team that they possibly can be like obviously you know a lot of people right now still have you guys favor to win the shield and win the or win the east and also the shield um so it's like what what do you think is going to be like the the ultimate like the on-field keys to the toronto arrows being a successful team in 2021 I think it's, you know, the, the skill execution um, and our ability to, to be fit enough and fast enough to get around the pitch and to kind of dominate teams. The, the game now is moving just so fast and so quick and decisions are, are being made at such a high level and an error really, really costs you now, um, especially if you watch any of those international games, miss pass, miss tackle could easily be a try, right? So you have to be really good at doing the small things. Um, and I think that's something we're really focusing on here in training camp is, you know, the little passing, the little, what are our running lines looking like? How are we tackling guys? Getting those small things right so it looks good in the big picture. So, uh, Lucas, we're going to move on now to kind of looking at Rugby Canada as a whole because, again, the last Rugby Canada match that we have seen was at the World Cup. Now, it's been quite a long time. And my our first question for you is, with such a long layover from Canada's last match, has the coaching staff from Rugby Canada put a focus, you know, on you or some of your your teammates uh, in the upcoming season? Like, have they kind of said we want to fo- you to focus on this, this, and this this season? You know, more tackles, more t- more turnovers, or have they kind of just said just go out there and and and, and be Lucas Rimball? No, no, they're they're always uh, you know helping us out here, always giving us feedback. Um, and again, something the arrows are working on. It's as they're kind of intertwined in some of the ways they think and some of the outcomes they have. Um, it's that speed, and I would say that skill aspect of the game where I think we've lacked behind. Um, and it's just your, your ability to do things under pressure at a high level, um, which we don't really get too many exposures to, you know, and it's something we've been lacking. So I think the really putting on an emphasis on us getting you know, a little handling right, the tackling right, and the, just the speed and the way you do things. And so kind of with that being said too, like the high performance camp that happened in November, like what, obviously like, what was that like just kind of finally coming back onto the pitch for the first time? And what would it have been like eight months or so with uh, the rugby can and the lads with a bunch of guys from the arrows and stuff as well. It was a refreshing change. You know, we, we did do some small sided stuff in the fall and and late summer there with the arrows when we thought we were gearing up for a few exhibition games but it was nothing like you know even just having a mulling session against other four hearts because you you kind of weren't allowed to do that but now at that camp we got we were able to do those things we were able to you know train 15 v 15 stuff that seems you know just a given back before covid and something sometimes you dread if you know you weren't feeling up for it but because it'd been so long and it like just was surreal and and a nice thing to kind of get a good way to break it up. And I guess at the high performance camp too, uh, you guys would have been kind of introduced to uh, one of the new members of the coaching staff there and Rob Howley, um, who comes over from Wales, British Irish lions brings an unreal rugby resume to rugby Canada here. And obviously is also going to be helping out with the, uh, the Toronto Aero staff through um, your 2021 season as well. So I guess like what, as a player, like what was your sort of your first impressions of Rob Howley as a coach? Uh, as a player, just how knowledgeable he is. You know, if you come up to him with a question, you'll just see his gears working and he'll have an answer for you. And if you don't understand the way he explains it, he'll explain it another way. Um, and the way he kind of, we'll think of a up of drill on the spot is crazy. You know, it looks like this thing that he's thought about for days and and kind of written down a bunch of times and re-scratched, but you'll be like, I want to work on the short side attack. You know, Rob, can you help me out after training? Sure. Set something up quickly. Boom. You're into it. Um, Just that knowledge base is something that I really haven't experienced at that level yet. So it was was crazy to see it. So a little bit of a, interesting question is that um, Rugby Canada last year announced that their kit supplier was changing from Canterbury to Macron and if uh, you know COVID hadn't happened we would have seen the new Canada kit in uh, 2020 obviously that has yet to be released because of the situation going on in the world Um, 
So Macron have also supplying teams like Italy, Scotland, uh, Wales as well. And so what would you like Canada's kit to have? Because as the Arrows have taken note, there is a market for collars on rugby shirts in Canada. It's been a while. I did try on some of the Macron kit in 2020. Um, so oh, boy. It wasn't uh, the proper markups or anything like that. It was just more of a sizing thing. But, I, yeah, it's it's exciting. And that, that collar market, I think, is definitely something to you know keep an eye on. I, I don't know if I can say too much here, but it's definitely hot and in right now. Our, our last question for you, um, Lucas, and we kind of talked about your your OUA's experience at the beginning of the show and also before we started recording, but you you were part of uh, the Queen's rugby dynasty and set up uh, during your university years, and the revitalization of the Canadian University Championships has kind of been something that um, Canadian rugby fans have been looking forward to pre-COVID. Uh, my question to you is, what do you think the future of the OUAs and also the Canadian University Championships have on Canadian rugby and the Arrows? I think it's got like a really massive future and involvement in the development of guys coming through. If you just look even at the Arrows roster right now, like there's so many guys who have played in that league, uh, whether it's the OUA or whether it's on the West Coast at UBC or UVic. Um it's another stepping stone that kind of fills that gap between underage rugby or, or youth rugby and kind of men's rugby. Um, without it, you go from playing high school where you're introduced to maybe playing on like a thirds force team at a rugby club against 30 year olds who are probably, you know, 50, 60 pounds heavier than you. So um, it definitely fills a, a spot that's needed. And I think it's, it's quality rugby as well. It's, it keeps getting better. The more resources you keep putting into it, um, the coaching has gotten better. They're hiring full-time guys, you know, there's more development coming into it. And I'm excited to kind of see where it goes, but it will be a key cog in developing the players, you know, whether it's for the arrows, whether it's for Canada, MLR, whatever it is, it will be key. And I'm kind of jealous. I missed out on that. Uh, Canadian. <laughs> you know, the championship that would have been really cool to have played in. And, and, you know, we're seeing to also pay dividends on the women's side. I mean, you look at uh, some of the women's players that are playing in the premier 15s. Um, some of them are former uh, Queens uh, rugby, rugby players, you know, Sophia DeGood and Taylor Black both played for Queens. Um, it really is, has been kind of bearing fruition on both sides of the coin for the men's and the women's. So it is quite exciting. Um, is there any kind of pinpoints? I mean, this year is going to be a really busy year for Canadian rugby, not just including MLR. You know, we've got the women's world cup. We've got the Olympics. Um, you know, your test matches uh, for Canada this year are going to be really important leading into the new uh, world cup cycle and qualifications, all that. So is there any Canadian rugby that you're like just fired up to see this year? Ooh, any Canadian rugby this year you know I'm kind of excited it might not you know be super kind of like in your face but just to see the return of like men's club rugby um something I haven't seen in a while and I know the beach have a, a new head coach and you know they're taking steps to kind of improve the game at that level so I'm, I'm really curious to see how that goes and because that's another layer that can really start feeding into these uh you know professional sides like the MLR and um, and the national team as well that kind of they've been lacking in past years, but it has been more of a, a social side to a lot of those games. And it's exciting to see them take more steps because I know there's academy programs now popping up around clubs to try and, you know, get kids at a younger age involved in that high performance side of things. So that kind of grassroots level, I guess, is what I'm more excited to see start back up. See, now, yeah. now I'm kind of curious, though, just because you, you did sort of you did bring it up like. I know, like, what do you think needs to kind of be done or what would you like kind of recommend like clubs or anything or I guess rugby can as a system in general, like, what do you think needs to be done to get more like kids interested in rugby at say like a younger age 
as maybe even like as opposed to saying like most people like are introduced to it like in high school like mm. is there anything that you think can be done to get like say younger kids and stuff involved in rugby earlier or exposed to them a little bit more it's uh it's a tough question you know because you don't really know what's going to work and it's it's a tough sport to kind of get people involved in um but it's i think getting it into schools is key and it doesn't have to be at that contact level it could just be getting it into gym classes or getting it you know, when they're in elementary school, because that's how I got in. I, I wouldn't have known about it if my brothers didn't go to high school with a guy who, you know, loved rugby and, and brought it to the school and coached it up and then even went the extra effort of, you know, bring your brother out, like come get him to try it, have some fun. So I think putting more resources into getting it into schools and then just keep promoting those rugby people that I, I know you guys are those people. You started a podcast based on it out of nowhere and those people like the Paul Durses who kind of they're not really getting much out of it other than bringing people into the game and, and showing people, you know, what a great sport rugby can be. And I guess my second follow-up question to that, just cause now I'm just curious, like, because you did mention how excited you are for just like the return of like club rugby. Like I know like how much, like say during an MLR season or whatever, do you guys like pay attention to things like the McCormick cup and like, where everybody's club and stuff is ranked or any or like how is, is there like trash is talking is what he wants to know and like yeah yeah i guess yeah. How, how many what are like the in clubhouse bets like on the uh oh. the men's rugby club schedule uh the boys are always you know going at each other about that you know the clubs they used to play for and uh in particular willie's doing a, like will kelly's doing a lot of work with uh the harlequins right now and you know He's, I don't know, a month ago, he's like, hey, I got a clip of you, like, getting smashed by <laughs> this guy. Like, I'm going to throw it up on the social media. Like, you know, kind of asking me if it's all right. I'm like, yeah, man, go for it. Like, <laughs> it, was, it was great banter. And all the guys played against each other back for those clubs, whether it was that age grade or men. So that's kind of where we started. So the boys have a sense of pride in, in the clubs they came through for sure. You guys brag that all the captains come from Balmy Beach, though? <laughs> A little bit, a little bit, both with the Queens as well. You know, there's there might be a, a small little cult there with the boys, but there you go. If you want to be the captain of the Toronto Arrows kids in your future, go to, uh, go to Balmy Beach and uh, learn to play. Balmy Beach, Queens, and grow your hair. It seems to be what's, uh, what's <laughs> yes. what works for for management. What's uh, what's the importance of order there though? Like, do you grow the hair out first before hair the- last? Hair at last. <laughs> Yeah, because you look at like both yours and like Dan Moore's like first caps for Canada, it's it's like short, short hair. So the hair comes last, that's for sure. Yeah, I know it could be it could be going sometime soon. It's starting to kind of kind of weigh on me. Maybe I'll get a fresh cut for the season. Who knows? There you go. And while when once things are open, yeah. Well, Lucas, we really appreciate you, man, coming on. Uh, you know, we were really looking forward to seeing what uh, what you're going to get up to in this season, and we wish you wish you the best of luck starting at, in Atlanta. Beauty, thanks for having me. I, I love doing this, and you guys are awesome. This, this podcast is great. I do listen to it all the time, so I'm excited to finally be a guest. Well, we appreciate that. And, uh, folks, if you want to listen to um, more of these episodes or listen to what uh, Lucas's teammates have to say, because we've had a, quite a few of them on the show, uh, go to LaRouge Rugby on YouTube, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're all over the place. You know, Listen to some of our previous episodes and then review and let us know how you feel about us. And if it's great, let us know. If it's not great, then just don't, I mean, don't worry about it. <laughs> But uh, you know what? The season's coming up, guys, and uh, we are very excited to see what happens.